Welcome to Abralin ao Vivo, a conference series organized by the Brazilian Organization of Linguistics and uh, other linguistic associations and societies from around the world. I am your host for this session. My name is Alexander Kobina. I am professor of African linguistics from the University of Sao Paulo, Department of Linguistics. For this talk, I am I'm very happy to introduce to you Friederike Lübke. She is professor of uh, African studies at the University of Helsinki. Um, and uh, uh, well, she has been trained uh, at the University of Cologne in Germany and the Max Planck Institute of Nijmegen. And she has had a position for many years at SOAS London. Friederike has worked and published uh, extensively on the description of African languages, on the topics of field linguistics, multilingualism in Africa, and is currently focusing on um, alphabetization in multilingual contexts. I will, um, I will note down your questions that you can pose in the chat, and we will uh, put them to Friederike after her talk. So uh, please write, I will take note, and we will have a discussion on uh, Friederike's presentation after her talk. The uh, title of her talk is Multilingualisms in Africa. So I will uh, hand over to Friederike and we will meet again after her uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Friederike. So I start again. Um, my talk is on the languages um, that we use. Um, that are used in small scale multilingual settings and the language that we use um, to describe and imagine these languages. Um, and by small scale multilingual settings, I mean um, many very diverse settings um, where speakers um, use um, linguistic diversity and recognize languages as different and use this difference um, for social indexicality. And uh, okay, how do I advance now when I control? So, proximo. Okay, this is interesting because I, aha, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, I'll give you a very brief epistemological introduction, and then I'll focus on a glimpse at the architecture of small scale modeling that is not a particular type, which are also very internally diverse. Um, on the Upper Guinea coast of West Africa, and I'll focus on um, what has been indexed and is being indexed uh, in these settings uh, through history. How does language socialization happen? And what of that is about language? And what about that is maybe not so much about language or not consciously focusing on language? And which situational contexts shape communication and how? And I will end with a call for um, a multiple perspectives on language and language because as I argue only the development of such multiple perspectives and focus on how indexicality is construed allows us to make sense of it. Um, I will start by borrowing a metaphor from a paper uh, by Ghana and colleagues, uh, led by Adam Spadomo, and I'll really only borrowing the, the visual metaphor of the title of their paper here. Um, um, and they talk about multilingualism in Ghana as a kente, a, a very emblematic cloth that you can see here. I took a photo of a very battered kente cloth that I have at home, um, a kente of many colors. And so while uh, we are getting attuned to recognizing linguistic diversity and multilingualism around the world, um, we still are used to describing its patterns in rather universalistic terms, uh, colors here. Um, and this external perspective is certainly a valid perspective but it does not allow us to understand the internal motivations and the intricate patterns um, and how they are created and how they are interpreted by different stakeholders. However, a universal perspective always contains perspective. Um, as um, 
a leading decolonial thinker and a comparative literature researcher, Walter Mignolo reminds us. And the, a certain perspective, so this seeming universal perspective that has um, shaped um, the history of, of linguistics as a discipline incarnates a particular historically grounded perspective that coincides with colonial, colonial expansion. Um, because the, the models that we use are based on European experiences of the, time of the 19th century, um, when national languages, which were also imperial languages, were created, and with them, ethnic nation states. And so, again, quoting uh, Mignolo, um, I would like to move away with him from this idea that I do a fact that uh, they are primordial of linguistic entities. Um, although, you know, we, we can abstract from language use and describe language as, as such a system, but if we want to understand how people use language, um, then we need to move towards languaging, so towards the idea that speaking and writing are moves that orient and manipulate social domains of interaction, and also in interaction with other perspectives uh, and ontologies. Okay, this particular lingual perspective um, is sometimes implicit, very often explicit, not only in, in popular conceptions of language, but also in the tools of our discipline. So languages are reified and I contribute to that as a descriptive linguist. Um, we imagine them as uniformly territorialized. Um, language is often seen as the most prominent marker of ethnic identity. Language users are very often imagined as speakers and writers of one language um, based on the idealized conception of um, a European speaker of a national language. Most things in our special cases or new people who recognize um, that um, small scale multilingualism has existed uh, everywhere in the world. So I've seen numerous papers starting with uh, the trope in today's globalizing world, uh, multilingualism is the norm, etc. Um, heterogeneous language use is described in terms of contributing codes or as polyvalent. Um, as an admiration from, from the norm. Uh, languages seem to have absolute attributes, indigenous, colonial, modern, lingua franca, uh, etc. So I acknowledge that these were really broad brush strokes of a very complex uh, history of linguistic ideas of very complex fields. Um, but um, these perspectives are, are really um, real, uh, for instance, in multilingualism research, even your approaches um, that move away from seeing languages as given. Um, languaging or translanguaging approaches that then still take language as the implicit baseline that then can be crossed translanguaged. Okay. So this means, uh, and I include myself here, even when we approach linguistic diversity and how categories based on local naming practices, local language names, go. we invest them with meaning derived from particular experiences and schools of thought. And these schools of thought in the majority are eurocentric. Um, now, I, keeping this uh, lingual perspective, um, I give you a language-based uh, glimpse at linguistic diversity on the Upper Guinea coast of West Africa, the Atlantic coast um, of West Africa. And this linguistic diversity can be and has been captured mostly from a genealogical perspective. So you can see here that this area is really one um, that uh, hosts uh, languages of a great genealogical um, difference and distance belonging to two different branches of the Atlantic language family of the Niger Congo of Hylum. And the languages that I'll be mostly mentioning here uh, are in yellow. And that in addition, con 
also hosts um, languages that are not or only very uh, distantly genealogical related. Um, and these genealogical uh, groupings are very uh, much contested um, for reasons that I will not dwell into, as is this model in itself. So you find languages um, that belong to the Manda family of the Niger Congo phylum, and you find uh, in the part I'll, that I'll focus on French, uh, colonial language that has been present since the 19th century, and a Portuguese based Creole that has been around since the 17th century. Um, continuing to give you a lingual perspective on repertoires and how you can talk about them here. Uh, is, um, are some pro the profits of three speakers, just to give you a taste of how you can approach their repertoires. So um, Benjamin Mane from the uh, small village Anya Grand, where I uh, have worked for the past 10 years, speaks two languages that are only really spoken in tiny uh, places. Um, Bainu Guyaha, spoken in about 15 villages, Yola Susana, only spoken in the village of Susana in present day Guinea. So he also speaks languages that are more widely spoken in the area as a regional lingua franca, but also by speakers of languages. And he speaks uh, two languages that have a very uh, broad distribution. Um, Wolof, which is the de facto national lingua franca, and French, which is the only official language of uh, Senegal. If I were um, to adopt a different uh, perspective, still lingual perspective, I could probably say Bainuku Jaha is uh, Benjamin's mother tongue. And what would mother tongue mean? Uh, what would be his uh, hat? Um, it would be um, the focus language of his father, um, not that of his mother, which uh, is a different language. Um, his wife, Meta Djandi, has a different repertoire. So again, if you look, she speaks two local languages, one that she shares with her husband, and then one language that is sometimes seen as belonging to the Bainuk ethnicity, that is uh, internally linguistically diverse. And she speaks a uh, different uh, regional lingua franca, and she speaks Wolof. She does not uh, count or enumerate uh, French in her repertoire. She has grown up in neighboring Guinea-Bissau and um, has not gone to school. If at school, she would have learned Portuguese. Um, there's also a language that, uh, you know, we could label as a regional lingua franca in her repertoire. Um, and finally, at school, um, she is learning French, which is the only context in which French uh, is used in Bavance and Wolof, because children who start school do not speak any French and French is not taught as a foreign language, so children pick up basic uh, new skills in a language that are well and hence the teachers have recourse to the lingua uh, franca. Okay, if you wanted um, to describe uh, any of the others in terms of maybe current and multilingualism research in terms of mother tongue are one or two, um, we would have to say that she doesn't have mother tongue, which is in fact far most common language, Papel, because she was fostered into this literature of five and has been grown up, grown up since then. Um, in a very different language ecologies, so we would have to say that she doesn't speak a mother tongue. If we were to account as her one, um, we cannot really account for the way she acquires other languages. But we can really say she has several ones um, because. Um, Language acquisition, language socialization is not structured in order of language or in proportion of language or very often not several languages, but a very different pattern that we can pass. And I will get to that by moving to the architecture of small and more languages on the other makers. So the rhetoric that I've shown you um, are the kind of higher 
also end of the spectrum of religious diversity in West Africa. Um, and there are actually patterns that have been at least in terms of the linguistic diversity in terms of languages that have been uh, observed um, by very early external observers, so many, uh, namely um, by early um, travelers. So we can say that this is a pretty typical internal frontier society um, that characterized by no large centralized polities or state formations, um, is a refuge zone at the fringes of states, and that has been the epicenter of globalization since the 20th century, and has been marked from the point of value inception by the transatlantic slave trade. So, what we know from the sort of accounts is that there has been high extent high population with great overpopulation of the since the 15th century. And we also know from long sources that ethnic identities only emerge in the 19th century and place and of course with early identity modes, often a full reinterpretation of opposite terms. So what do we know for these early terms, regional terms, and what do they tell us really about um, how the central frontier society were most constantly break up from each other and reconstitute works. Well, actually, um, so this is um, a photo taken in the village of St. John, which is a village associated with a particular field because it's a Portuguese settlement. And we know that Iberian um, seafarers, navigators, traders, um, were in the area from very early on because the infamous Christopher Columbus himself was at the Upper Guinea coast and um, commented um, on it. Here's another traveler, um, Fernandez, um, who says in, uh, sorry, somehow one of my slides is missing. Okay, um, forget about the Columbus quote. So Fernandez said in 1506 that the Casamos River is a great trading river in a kingdom in which people of all nations are mixed together, Mandinkas, Flug, Palantas, and others. So we know we can recognize the names because some of these names are still used as glossal and ethnonyms today. Others have changed. But what we cannot know is the intention of these names because it's constantly shifting, um, as I will show you later. Aha, here we get to our Columbus um, quote. So these Iberian sources state linguistic diversity and actually also contributed to altering and increasing it um, because Columbus, before actually traveling uh, to South America and the Caribbean and finding uh, um, his way along um, the coast of West Africa, was in Guinea and uh, wrote in a letter to um, the Castilian king and queen that there are thousand different languages in Guinea with the result that one man does not understand the other. And the context here is that he was really interested in bringing Africans to um, uh, Castilia so that they could be trained as interpreters, but he found <laughs> that there were too many languages. So uh, it would be use useless actually to invest in that. And a little bit later, another, this time Portuguese traveler, uh, comments that the kingdoms of the blacks and their language are as many and various as their diverse customs, because everywhere in less than 20 leagues, around 100 square kilometers, there are two and three nations all mixed together with some of the king's minor and others powerful, the one subject to the other, and their sects and customs and the laws of the government and oath come for the most part to be all as one. So one really important architectural principle of multilingualism in the Casamance and on the Upper Guinea coast has already been observed, uh, though admittedly through very partial sources, by early Iberian travelers. Um, the fact that there's great linguistic diversity, um, while at the same time there is a great deal of cultural convergence. 
And uh, before I forget, I should mention um, that um, these early uh, Europeans um, settled in the Casamance. Here you can see actually the tomb of a Portuguese uh, settler in St. John. This, this tomb is probably from the 18th century, we don't know. So much later. Um, so the early Portuguese uh, travelers settled among Guineans as so-called lansados allegedly learned their languages and also taught Portuguese. So it is reported in historical sources that in the 15th, 16th centuries, Portuguese was spoken on the Upper Guinea coast and uh, that uh, local uh, notaries sent letters in Portuguese um, to Iberian uh, uh, royalties. And uh, Columbus himself, interestingly, um, Broad spoke. It's been described by historians who have studied his letters, a mix of Spanish and Portuguese. So, already a mix that was developed among Iberian seafarers who came from Portugal, Castilla, uh, Genova. So, how do we get this um, linguistic diversity going hand in hand? With just one that she Well, one, one second. Sorry, I can hear Miguel again. Somehow his mic seems to switch on. I will, um, sorry, I will talk to him <laughs> today. It's uh, it's it's all, uh, I don't know, it's, it's the 13th, it's not Friday the 13th, it's Saturday the 13th. Yes, but we will get through this. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> People are yes. there, they're patient, and uh, yes. I think everybody has experienced this. So. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry, sorry, uh, Friederike. <laughs> so not only uh, Portuguese settlers came and uh, initially actually settled with, with locals. Um, local settlements of this time um, were heterogeneous uh, places. Um, that were not built around the notion of a speech or a language community. That they became associated with languages is the result of a particular uh, process of territorialization. Um, to give you what, what creates the heterogeneity and also the sharing of elements of culture um, is uh, a great Nobility, long standing movement through the hosting of strangers, marriage exchanges, child fostering, ritual mobility, and economic migration that results in an exchange between villages, for instance, through marriage communities, something that we also uh, prominently observe, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the Valpes in Amazonia. Um, also, the exchange of children. Um, but also economic migration and other types of migration that actually bring people out of the small scale local exchange zones uh, and uh, embed them into uh, wider flows. Um, current interaction and mobility at the national scale brings French into the schools, uh, spreads Wolof as a national lingua franca, and this is something that actually started um, with um, um, French colonization because um, the French had their capital in Saint Louis and later in Dakar uh, associated with Wolof and so a Wolof broker elite brought Wolof into other areas where it wasn't used so much before. And Mandinka and Creole as regional lingua franca. Mandinka has a long history in the area, has been actually used in trade networks that predate the uh, Iberian uh, trade networks, the transatlantic ones, so in the north-south trans-Saharan uh, trade, and Creole from the 17th century. So we really need to ask ourselves, what is the motivation to keep up such a linguistic diversity, to name and uh, keep languages as distinct um, in such a connected uh, region. Since these cultural practices are all shared. And here is some examples for cultural practices that are shared. So we have initiation rites um, um, that take place in sacred groves. Here you see a photo 
um, mask dances, fertility rituals, um, intricate patterns of marriage exchanges, um, similar patterns of agriculture, of religion, and shrine uh, worship. And these practices are all already spread and very often federal, as has been described by Alex Kobina in a recent paper, although they are now often associated with the recently colonially introduced ethnic groups. So, well, if we want to understand why linguistic diversity is upheld, we need to understand languages as socially construed. And um, I here quote Sinfri Marconi, uh, who reminds us forcefully that the African languages that, that we find in language lists um, and catalogs and as standard languages were socially constructed as part oops, of the colonial invention of Africa. Um, my PowerPoint is also jinxed, okay. Um, but uh, the invention, the construction of African languages um, did not only start with colonization. So uh, languages were named by insiders and outsiders before. Um, and hence, this is a reminder um, that we always need to ask how languages were construed by whom and for whom. So if we want to understand uh, why languages are named and how they are construed, we need to ask what can be indexed to them. So why would people keep languages so different when they share so much? What is the motivation? Oh, now I'm going backwards. Okay. Everything is jinxed today, but here we are. So I drew these circles around these heterogeneous settlements before. Um, so one um, very local pattern of how languages are associated with places and are invested with meaning is um, through associating with them with a, with a place to signal who has founded this place. So here I'll give you three places. Um, Zigashor, um, the uh, colonial city, um, which is in many Casamance languages called Gubabu. Djibonke or Djibere, very well known to Alex. And Cabrus, Er, um, a village uh, on the Atlantic coast. So Gubabu, um, means actually, literally, Creole or the language of the Tubab and also the place of the Tubab. So Tubab is a very widely used West African uh, term for Europeans that allegedly comes from Arabic or words. Um, questionable. Okay, so Zigashaw was founded by the Tubab, meaning the Creole or the Portuguese. Djibonker, um, is the language of Djiberher, literally. So it was founded by people, by the people of Djiberher, by the founders. And Cabrus, Er, in its local language, um, is associated with the language Kerak, the language of Er. This is really interesting because it shows that we have similar language naming patterns and territorialization patterns for um, local settlements and Portuguese settlements. Ziganshaw was founded in 1645, the Creole traders from Cape Verde and um, has been a major uh, trading post uh, since then. Although it was always also inhabited by a very heterogeneous local population, it has been seen as a Creole city. And this pattern still persists, although um, Zigashaw has been under French rule since 1888 and is now um, part of Francophone uh, Senegal. Nevertheless, um, the 
denotation has not been changed. So Gubabo still means Ziganshor, uh, and Creole, it doesn't mean French. And an Ubabo is um, a European or Creole speaker. So this means that actually um, the naming patterns are the same and um, that um, you know, makes for an uh, interesting observation, namely that um, language territorialization patterns uh, akin to this principle um, have been called the founder principle in Creole Genesis, um, but they are actually corresponding directly to widespread localist naming patterns on the Upper Guinea coast. So uh, one might suggest actually um, that they inspired um, language territorialization in Creole contexts as well. Um, so why the languages of the founders? What makes them so special? Well, we have very uh, strong um, historical evidence for a particular settlement pattern in the Lower Casamance that really goes completely against the grain of uh, speech and language communities. Um, so, Places were settled by small family-based groups and um, those that founded the place were the landlords of the place, but they had no interest in staying by themselves. They actually tried to attract as many strangers as possible in order to create viable uh, settlements. And so they became the landlords of the place and had clients or strangers that they settled. These strangers uh, obtained lands to settle, but they did not have ownership um, of the land and they did not control the very powerful shrines that were uh, creating a type of political authority. Now, the patrimonial language is the language, so the language that is associated with the place is the language associated with the landlords of a place. Strangers or clients will not claim this language even if they speak it, even if it's part of their repertoire. They don't focus it in their identity. What they will retain is in their identity is um, the language of the place from which they originated, um, where they were the landlords. But of course, over time, strangers can claim land as theirs and become the landlords. So cut out a space of the former uh, patrimony and become landlords of the new dwelling. So um, they take over. So to recap this very important local meaning to what it means to have a language is that it links you to a place. And I said that there, and I quoted uh, Marconi to remind us that all these concepts um, are also interacting with colonization. And so we actually have different language ideas now coexisting. So we get influences of um, an ethno-nationalist uh, ancestral language uh, ideology as well that sees um, a language as the language of all the ancestors of present day inhabitants. And that contrasts very drastically with the patrimonial language, which is only the language of the remembered founding clan. And these two different ideologies have been described for two villages that are not very far away from each other. So what is happening in these different territorialization models when we look at language ideologies? So in the ancestral model, we have very heterogeneous set of inhabitants of a place and we draw a circle around it and associate it with a language through iconizing one particular group. And this is not only the founders, but uh, in a patrilineal uh, society, it's the male descendants of the founders. Uh, sorry, I'm talking about the ancestral model here. Okay, so we iconize them and we erase all the others. So we turn the founders into all the ancestors. In the patrimonial model, we also have very heterogeneous inhabitants and uh, we focus, we iconize the male descendants of founders, at least in patrilineal uh, settlements, but we do not completely erase the others. We still acknowledge that they are there, 
So if I, for instance, ask um, present day inhabitants of Bainog villages, um, you know, about who lives, they will point out these stranger settlements and say, you know, um, we are really happy that we have so many strangers because you need strangers in order to be strong. Or when I talk about marriage with um, current inhabitants of Anyak, they will say, well, you know, you really, if you are a strong man, you need to marry a woman that comes from somewhere else. Otherwise you are weak. Um, so this is not um, such a clear-cut case of linguistic exogamy as uh, reported for, for many Amazonian settings, uh, most uh, iconically the, the Lopez. Um, but it is um, a real strong habitus towards acknowledging, nurturing um, heterogeneity in order to create a stronger uh, community. Now, what else is indexed uh, by people? Well, also relationships between places. So in an area that was deeply affected by the transatlantic slave trades, people really needed to create versatile political alliances um, and multiple alliances because people were not only uh, victims of the slave trade, but also took part in the slave trade. They had to sell people into the slave trade in order to buy the iron uh, that they needed to protect themselves. Um, and hence, you needed very many and versatile alliances that could be easily contextually uh, invoked or undone. And so we find many, many different expressions of these relationships, uh, not only in initiation rights that happen uh, federally, but for instance, in uh, ritualized relationships between places as uh, between these two villages, um, as has been described by Kobina in 2019, where the king of the reign king of this territory of the Mof Avi, that is here dotted with red, had a dependency uh, in Djibonkea, uh, um, a village not inside his kingdom. And so he would address the local shrine holders in the language of his kingdom. And then the Dibonkera would do the necessary ceremonies in Ubahar. And similar relationships between places are very widespread. So we have corresponding ponds, trees that talk to each other. So when a sacrifice is done at one, on one riverbank, um, its effects will be felt on the other riverbank. And these also put languages into relationships because depending on which spirit um, binds these places together, a particular language will be selected. Um, profession is another um, important um, aspect of identity that can be indexed through language. So professions and particular crafts throughout West Africa can be linked with particular languages. Um, and sometimes also these um, professional groups can have particular um, uh, social status, so there can be endogamous professional groups um, that cohabit uh, with others but cannot intermarry, for instance. And so in the Lower Casamance, um, what is very emblematic is that Pular are the local cattle herders. So if you see a group of cattle, you will uh, look out for the Pular, the Fuller herdsman, um, who will not be uh, far. And here you can actually see Pula performing their own identity in an ethnic carnival in Anyak 2019. So this hat is very iconic, um, as is the language associated with this profession. Religion can also be indexed through language. And some uh, language associations are very fixed and very long standing. So, Mandinka, a Manda language, for instance, is seen as the language of Islam on the Upper Guinea coast and has been uh, since the 13th uh, century when proselytizing uh, Mandinka traders brought it and also brought writing in Mandinka. So, Mandinka is one of the most written languages, and many people are exographic and writing in Mandinka in Arabic characters, so called Ajami, illustrated here in this picture. Um, Christianity, on the other hand, has from early on been indexed through Creole. Um, but local religions, as I mentioned before, can also be associated with particular languages, depending on the shrine holder 
or also the ancestor who is venerated at these shrines and the language that they are assumed to speak. So another uh, very important function of languages that is not only attested on the Upper Guinea coast, but also has been described by colleagues working in Cameroon, um, Piapolo Di Caro, Jeff Good, and, and their team, as spiritual protection. And um, here I focus on one part of uh, spiritual protection that is uh, really widespread in, in the Casamance um, and involves really linguistic undercover uh, treatment. So um, there is a ritual that is called Kubos, Kanyalen in Ndiola languages. Um, and that is seen as being possessed by a spirit that either causes infertility or infant death. And the women or children affected or endangered by this evil spirit um, are removed from their normal context of living and are given a new identity, very often explicitly a new linguistic identity. They're given new names and they spend very often years uh, in this environment in order to be invisible to the spirit until either a woman has given birth and ideally several times and the children have survived up to a certain age out of toddler doom or uh, for children when they are removed until they are four or five years old or even longer. And so here you see two examples, um, actually uh, a man and his wife and both took part in this ritual and for Dominique this entailed an additional Creole identity that has become part of his focused uh, linguistic identity. So in addition to his uh, name that he was given at birth, Dominique, he has a Creole name in Perego from Interregado, borrowed. He was borrowed by others in order to be removed from this spirit. And he is known, he is known as this and this added identity stays with him, stayed with him until and beyond his death. And his wife Hortense, in turn was an Ubos, um, so she lost um, several children and then moved to a different village where a different Bainu language is spoken. She was given a different name, Bugaga Manga, and stayed away from uh, her husband's uh, household uh, until four of her children had reached um, the age of, the last of them, the age of four or five. So this means um, all these different patterns, aspects of identity that can be indexed through language means that um, linguistic identity is not categor categorical, it is relational. Um, and here I owe much actually to uh, research from our Cameroonian colleagues, Steph Good Di Carlo uh, uh, and Aguara and Oyong. So a categorical identity is uh, what can be, you know, <laughs> very obviously uh, demonstrated with a passport, this idea of having one linguistic identity that corresponds to a mother tongue and a focused ethnic identity of which you can only have one and in some special cases two. Uh, but that cannot easily be altered or complemented and that also uh, limits ownership of a language. So although I speak English, I could never claim it as my identity language. Um, whereas in these contexts where places, religions, particular circumstances, um, even um, protection from spirits is indexed by language, the language use uh, and linguistic identities are relational. And since it is seen as positive to have a maximum number of relations, it is seen as positive to have as many different languages in one's semiotic toolkit as possible. As a consequence, there are only very few settings in, uh, in the Casamance and on the Upper Guinea Coast where language use is really strictly constrained. So where we could talk about a domain in, in the sense of uh, fishmen. And these contexts comprise, for instance, uh, religious and ceremonial uh, contexts, um, but also prescriptive contexts, which are very often induced by linguists, and some diglossic contexts 
that came uh, through colonization and remain in the post-colonial language ecologies. What is much more widespread are relational flexible contexts um, where either um, we have um, federal language context where multiple languages are maintained as separate uh, but translated or actually juxtaposed without translation. Um, this reminds um, Amazonian context, for instance, of the Upper Shingu, or context where we have very fluid intermeshed language use, and that uh, happens in context where participants know each other's repertoires and um, where they sometimes can remain within the confines of a named language if they want to, but very often there's very flexible uh, languaging that makes use of all parts of the shared repertoires. So I hope I made some sense of local meanings of languages that are very different than, than meanings that we know from uh, nation state contexts. Um, so how, what does it mean um, that we have these very different ideas of languages for uh, language socialization. How are repertoires shaped? So um, I'll give you an example from uh, uh, that um, we describe in two papers um, in press that illustrate um, um, very vividly um, how uh, repertoires are actually linked to mobility and trajectories at a very local scale. So here you uh, see an area of very uh, small scale. So this is corresponds to 10 kilometers. And you see um, the trajectory of a male individual, GS, in his 30s, who currently lives in Jibonker, here, where Bainuku Burha is the patrimonial language. And um, so he actually lived, he was born in here in Nyasia with Bayot as the patrimonial language and picked up several languages here. Um, then he moved to Zingan Shore and then um, to uh, Esil in the Diolabandia language area. And you see, uh, together with the places that are the stopovers on his trajectory, the languages that he himself said he acquired there and in the names that he gave. Okay, why, how does this come about? Well, in a nutshell, his father is from Dibonquer. His mother is very widespread, although not always attested, comes from a different place with a different language, patrimonial language. His mother is from Isil. But he grew up with his mother in Nasya, where he learned the patrimonial language of this place and his mother's patrimonial language. So not his patrilective, where, where to speak Amazonian here. Um, he then lived in Zigashore and went to school there. And um, that's why he added French and Wolof to his repertoire before moving back with his mother to a seal, uh, learning the patrimonial language of a seal, which is also his mother's patrimonial language. Then only as an adult, he moved to his father's village and learned its patrimonial language, which if we were to look at him in terms of mother tongue or identity language, would be his identity language because ethnic identity is um, construed as based on paternal lineage. Additionally, he learned Creole and Portuguese through socializing with Parma and Tapas from Guinea-Bissau. And since he's only in his 30s, his <laughs> linguistic journey is far from over. And we can expect that he will uh, pick up and more languages and reshape his repertoire. So how can we capture this? What does it mean to learn languages in this way and to continue learning languages throughout one's lifetime? People from Casamance are notorious for their great skills as language learners throughout their entire lifespan. Uh, here is an attempt. So this is uh, my colleague, uh, Rachel Watson, who has somehow tried 
to give a contrastive snapshot of two different points in GS's life, 1995 and 2015, look at these languages and try to formalize um, what importance they had for his identity, how frequently he used them, what his attitude towards them were, and what access he had to the prototypical norms for patrimonial speakers who actually also lived in their patrimonial language area. And uh, without going into details, you see that um, 20 years have actually reshaped his entire repertoire dramatically. So how do we approach this um, with a European view of multilingualism in terms of competence, fluency, frequency, vocabulary size, etc.? Okay, I move on um, to my next and final question. In these settings, well, if you believe me, um, social indexicality, indexicality is at the core of keeping and using uh, many languages. How is this indexicality achieved? Well, um, one uh, part of indexicality is naming and listing languages as parts of repertoires. And this is not only an external perspective because people themselves name and list languages and comment on others' languages because it is really, it's an important cue to know how to interact with somebody, to know where they are from. And you may be tempted to think that we can actually um, have some degree of referentiality and a clear denotation, a clear intention of particular language names, either from an insider perspective as endoglossonyms or from an outsider perspective as exoglossonyms. However, um, um, as I hope I will show on this slide, this is not possible. So, for instance, um, a speaker from the village of Bandial can name their uh, local language as the Jola of Bandial. However, when Bandial is also used as the kind of um, metonym um, for the entire kingdom of Mofavi, where this uh, they're very similar local lects that can also be differentiated as belonging to the different villages making up this kingdom are spoken. Um, so already we need to know which Banjal is it the one of the village of Banjal or is it the Banjal of the entire kingdom? Um, but still we could assume referentiality. Um, there is a different name um, that is not uh, widely invoked with speakers themselves, Jola Egima, based on one particular linguistic form. Um, there is a contemporary ethnic group, Jola, so a speaker of any of these uh, languages could also emphasize this shared ethnicity and call their language Jola. And we might still be thinking that we can build a Russian Jola model um, of scale, but um, I show you on. Uh, next slides um, that this is not so easy. It becomes even more difficult and impossible if we try to reconstruct historical um, glossonyms, which are mostly exoglossonyms, so names that others had. Um, so you've uh, encountered Fulup in historical sources, um, which somehow very often is taken to correspond to present-day Gyola, but we don't know how it was used and what it encompassed. And uh, to add confusion, Fluk is also used in present day uh, naming um, for a different Diola area. And all different neighbors and outsiders have different names for different portions of this Diola pie. And what they include and what they don't include depends entirely on their trajectory and exposure and knowledge of different Yola languages. So we cannot achieve referentiality. All we have is scale and perspective. And this means that we need to understand what enables speakers and what motivates them to use particular names in a particular way. Okay, 
this actually is not only a, a, um, a contemporary um, a concern, but is also already present um, uh, when we look at sources and um, try to identify what they were talking about. So um, we have um, a colonial word list of the biggest word list of African languages, I think 154. That was uh, created by um, a missionary who was working in Freetown, Sierra Leone, with liberated slaves from all over West Africa, Polyglotta Africana. And this missionary, Sigismund Kölle, um, compiled little notes, little biographical blurbs on his informants. And so he has one informant who comes uh, from, probably from Diola Banyal, uh, one of the uh, areas that I talked about a lot. And um, his name is Isam Bakon. And he said that he had uh, traveled widely um, across the entire uh, Upper Guinea coast. He had spent um, years in the Portuguese town of Cacheo and Bissau, and then in other areas and villages that are impossible to identify to the linguist Edward Sapir, who tried to actually find out what um, this uh, informant spoke in 1971. Now, Isambakon himself talks about Fulup, speaking Fulup and offers words in Fulup. Um, Edward Sapir, um, more than 100 years later, places the speech forms as Yola Banyal, because they are the closest, according um, to um, his comparative studies, to um, the village of Banyal. So what he says is that Isambakon um, clearly offers Fulup in the general sense employed by the Portuguese and does not offer really his own ethnolect. Um, and he calls this inaccurate. Now, what we don't know is what else Isambakun spoke and how his trajectory had actually influenced um, his identification and the way in which he identified himself and his language. So here we have uh, a view that adopts one perspective and assumes that there can only be one perspective that can be correct. So either you speak Fulup or you speak Bandial. And if you say you speak Fulup, this can only be upscaled uh, from Bandial um, in order to facilitate comprehension. What we do not have is an understanding of that actually um, language use and identification and naming is an interactional indexical uh, process that is um, shaped by the interaction and to which there is not only one answer. This can be illustrated um, by um, a social linguistic interview um, conducted by Samantha Goodchild and, and she wrote a paper on this. And here you can see a brief illustration trying to find out. So it's, she comes with a linguist perspective on you speak a particular diola. And uh, so she tries to find out which languages do you speak, which also has actually a misunderstanding in the forms because quelle langue parlez-vous is in written French in the plural, but in spoken French in the singular. And so her interviewee and answers diola. And she's trying to find out which Jolla. Oh, is it the Jolla of here? And he says, hmm, yes. She says, uh-huh. And any other Jollas? And he says, yes. But she wants a list. So which ones? And he says, mm, you, do you understand a Jolla? Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you understand? So what is clear is here that we have actually a dialogical process in which the interviewee tries to find out which categories the interviewer wants so that he can correspond, uh, that he can respond accordingly. And actually before um, completely changing tack and allowing these multiple perspectives um, and, and trying to understand what knowledge they encapsulate, um, Sam, as many of us did when we started, um, we're trying to standardize this. So, 
because she knew already that the speaker was from Jola Banyal, she automatically translated Jola in his responses into Jola Banyal because that was the Jola he spoke. But if he was very mobile and had access to many different linguistic features that can be associated with very different Jola languages, what does it mean to speak a Jola? So what she also found is that, of course, activation and naming of repertoires um, is very different in different social linguistic spaces. And so it's important to understand these spaces. Um, in the village of Essil, as I've shown before, there is a very strong ancestral language ideology. So Essil is seen as a monolingual village. It should be monolingual. And if women and other people come in from the outside, they are expected to quickly assimilate and learn Diola Banjai. And so when Sam interviewed um, a couple, a married couple, um, it uh, turned out um, that the man um, gave Diola Banjal French and Wolof in his repertoire, and the woman stated that she was monolingual in Banjal. She stated this, however, in French. So it clearly is an ideological statement that we can only understand if we understand the language ideologies of the place of Banjal and also particular views on gendered language. So for instance, it is very, uh, it's not well viewed when women speak French and also not when they speak Wolof. Um, is seen as making them upwardly mobile and more prone to actually not want to stay in the rural sphere, but to go uh, migrate to town and, and work as um, um, and domestic um, aides, for instance. And, and so there's a very negative connotation with a woman anyways to um, count French in her repertoire, count Wolof in her repertoire, although um, they're all actually speak it. And additionally, in this area, it's viewed very negatively if women do not adapt to um, their husband's uh, language and to the monolingual language ideology. However, um, when some actually recorded uh, interactions, it turned out that the same woman who had stated that she only spoke Jola Banjal in French, also spoke French, Wolof, Mandinka, Creole, and that when she named languages outside this space, she would not name the language actually as Jola Banjal, but as Jola. So how languages are named does not have much to do with the, the actual shape of speech form, but with the ideologies that are created in a particular interactive context. And how repertoires are named also depends on these social linguistic spaces. So how then can we identify features associated with languages? What does it mean to speak a Jola? And here again, we can bring different perspectives together in order to understand what is really going on. Uh, this is uh, Rachel Watson's uh, research. And uh, she uh, recorded um, a conversation um, that took place in a Catholic um, seminary in uh, the village of Brown that is associated with uh, the patrimonial language of uh, Kujirai and Yola language. And so this was um, a social network study with accompanying recordings. So the central participant was wearing a clip on microphone. The researcher wasn't present. And one of the um, participants also transcribed um, this conversation and tagged language as he saw it. Now, what is interesting in um, the recording is that the, um, according to um, the speech participants, their intention was to speak one particular Yoda language. So their pragmatic intent was to stay within one named language that they all couldn't name. Um, and that was Yola Casa. Now for the linguists, from the linguist perspective, the speech was very heteroglossic and contained elements that she associated with other uh, Yola languages. 
And here you can see, for instance, um, some of these forms. I will not go into the detail here. And uh, this little set of discourses I guess, interesting questions to me, which could be very many texting. And what prompted transcribers to tag the text as CASA when it contains some really emblematic features that can be univocally associated with CASA, some that can be at, um, actually associated with other languages, and some that are just pan yellow, they are shared. Um, so there would be, uh, um, for instance, um, could be called uh, floating or ambivalent or polyvalent features, yet they were identified as belonging to CASA. So, um, our understanding is that these verdicts, as do verdicts on purity, demand uh, on emblem emblematicity, and that this emblematicity is also uh, dependent on perspective and exposure and knowledge of particular forms. And I cannot resist um, to give you um, this uh, very charged statement of a speaker of Bainuku Baha on speakers of a different Bainuk language, Bainuku Nyamolo. And he says of them, so they have been colonized by the Mandinka. They don't say a word without adding Nko. Nko means I say in Mandinka. It's very emblematic for Mandinka. It's even the name for a particular uh, Mandinka script. And it is us who speak a pure Bainuk. Um, now, if you read closely, you will not miss the irony that actually the word for pure, pure, is French. Um, but that this uh, speech is actually, from my perspective and from Alex Kobina's perspective, mixed. So we find uh, French forms that are here also seen as French. So the transcription already contains an analysis. Um, and an identification. You find a direct quote, Mandinka, uh, but you also find forums, um, and this is here my perspective added to this, um, that are shared by several of the other languages. Yet the uh, pragmatic intention was clearly to speak um, by Nukubaha, and we would clearly, everybody would agree that this is the matrix language, so to speak. Now, what is interesting is that actually, for speakers of Bainuku Jahar, the Bainuk language I work on, um, Gunyamolo exhibits a very different mix. So they say about Gunyamolo speakers that they mix a lot with Jola, not with Mandinka. And sorry, Alex, uh, to tell you this, but they would also say actually that speakers of Gubara speak like little children. And the only Bainuk speakers that speakers of Gujara can really understand are speakers of Kasanga. Who are bilingual in Gujar. So. Um, so what does this mean? It means that here speakers of this area um, are not very much exposed to Mandinka, have very generally negative attitudes towards Mandinka, which is a language of religious types that from the 19th century. So for them, uh, Mandinka is really other and very noteworthy. They do not uh, pay so much attention uh, to things that are shared with Yola languages because they are in a language ecology where many Yola languages are spoken. On the other hand, speakers of Bainuku Jaha in a language ecology where Mandinka is much, much more rooted and that use it much more, um, it is much less othered. And what is much more obvious is the mix with, with Jola, which is not so frequent in these language ecologies to um, the east of Zingashaw. So the mixing is not an objective fact of speech, but it is a matter of interpretation and perspective. And this is also related, of course, to the fact that these languages are not standardized. So there is no baseline, not even a heuristic baseline that is very often assumed. The multilingualism researchers who, who work in European language ecologies or ecologies where there is one European standard language that can serve as a heuristic baseline. So this means that um, speakers uh, encounter much variation and also speak very variably. 
And uh, so the variation here is uh, symbolized between speakers by the outer uh, fringes of the Venn diagram. And if we want to know what um, a language is, then the univocal core is actually only a very small inner uh, section of the Venn diagram if you want to symbolize it uh, like that. And depending on their language socialization and repertoires, linguists and speakers will have different prototypes of a language and hence differ in their judgments. Um, this is illustrated here. So um, again, only taking three languages into account, of course, that would explode if we took more languages into account. So um, the divergence areas are areas where codes are reified and develop indexical potential. And uh, so these are emblematic areas in phonology and lexicon that are differentiated where other areas converge. Um, however, perspective and scale determine which features are seen as prototypical and how non-prototypical features are classified. Because classified they are. For a speaker of only Bainung, lub is a Bainung word. And for a speaker of only Diola, lub is a Diola word. Um, and the same holds incidentally also for linguists because uh, how uh, contact features are identified as contact features really depends on perspectival knowledge. Um, so this means that what we see is that perspective and scale um, create an indexical potential to index particular identities, more often than not patrimonial identities, and to enregister them. And only um, once they are enregistered, they, they are named as languages. But a lot of the variation is not really enregistered to a named register or language. Multiple perspectives on adaptive practice. Why? Well, I hope I have convinced you why it is important. Um, not the least because um, only multiple perspectives allow us to understand what speakers do when they use languages. And um, again, I have to uh, cite Marconi and Pennycook um, in the important book on uh, deconstituting and reconstituting languages. We need to take languages as a notion apart before we can rebuild it or try to interpret it in the way speakers see it. That also means um, that we actually recognize that there is not necessarily a qualitative difference between what speakers on the upper guinea coast do in their discourse, which is always mixed and how we see and analyze and frame the mixture is uh, a question of perspective. Um, and that this is in fact very similar to Creoles. And just as Creoles, um, these languages are then named if they fulfill a particular social function. In the Upper Guinea Coast context, most notably of linking people to a place of which they have ownership. Looking at multiple perspectives um, and at motivations for multilingualism that come out of the communicative practices, somehow requires one thinking about multilingualism as well. So it means that in small scale multilingual settings, individuals have perhaps more languages. And I mean, here also in terms of local perspectives, more languages they can name, but less of a language they do not have several uh, stacked up languages. What they have is a dramatically increased social semiotic potential. Um, and the languaging options that are multiplied through them because they can express so many different facets of sameness or difference. 
Um, whoops, again, my PowerPoint is doing something I don't want it to do. Okay. It also means um, lose control. Sorry, just bear with me. Okay, here we are again. Okay, so it's also important that we complement monolingual vantage points. So why are people multilingual? Why or do they code switch that are ultimately derived from a monolingual baseline with approaches that investigate how language is construed by starting from heterogeneous speech forms and looking at how indexicality achieved in language use and beyond. And so what is also important is that we should start with heterogeneous speech and how it is construed as mono or multilingual by whom and in which context. And that way, in that way we can account for many more speech contexts than starting by looking at more language-based contexts and small scale multilingual settings. But as linguists, we are always trained to start by looking at a language. And speakers give us that um, because it also um, very often corresponds to identities that are focused from them, albeit in, in ways that are very different uh, than from what we perceive. But in a small scale multilingual context, for instance, uh, it may make much more sense uh, in order to account for a lot of what happens in speech to ask, oh, why would people be monolingual rather than why would people be multilingual or why would they code switch? And so for this, we need multiple viewpoints um, and we cannot uh, simply um, expect that we can find a clear triangulation. Rather, we will find that different speakers have different viewpoints, but also different observers have different viewpoints. And actually these viewpoints are already built into transcription. Transcription is not neutral. Who is represented, how viewpoints are represented, how they are analyzed, are all perspectival processes. Um, and the same holds for researchers. And also what we need to acknowledge is that um, not all cues are linguistic. So as linguists, we always think of language as the most iconic cue. But very often when speakers classify situations and, and speech, and when they produce speech in interaction, they pay attention to many, many features that are not linguistic. So for instance, what they know about the speaker, how they are dressed, um, what other aspects of identity they form, sorry, style, um, through uh, religious accessories, what is already, what parts of meaning are already contributed by the place in which a conversation um, takes place, etc. So, just like these. Um, signs here to a sacred grove um, and here to um, the uh, indexing um, the Bainuk delegation to the coronation of a new Bainuk king combine old meanings into new forms and adapt them to a new context. I think what we need to do when we approach small scale multilingualism is see the kente, but do not try to describe its colors uh, uniquely with externally uh, derived categories, um, but understand it as an ever evolving pattern and a never finished tapestry that adapts its shapes, its patterns and its materials to ever changing social requirements. Just like this kente by the Ghanaian artist Ella Natsui that actually 
is as ambivalent as language use because it may be accented to you or it may be an assemblage that makes use of bottle tops and um, metal tins. And um, here I have arrived at the end of my talk. If you want to uh, read more about the Crossroads project on which much of the uh, research I presented is based, uh, here's a link to publications and the multilingual corpus. I was not able <laughs> to um, play any video or audio files. It was difficult enough actually to get my PowerPoint to work. Thank you for your patience. But if you want to actually look at multilingual language use in the Cosmos, you can watch the documentary Can Rachel and listen to the many languages, including Creole, and also see multilingualism in action through subtitling. And finally, Alex mentioned that I am involved not in alphabetization, but in a repertoire-based literacy program that aims at creating a flexible literacy that can be as mono or multilingual as required for flexible multilingual readers together with a Senegalese association. And you can read about that here. And that was it. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Friederike. That was uh, amazing. We had a, a bit of a bumpy start, but uh, but the quality of the sound was, was very nice. And your audience, um, I can see from the questions that they were interested and uh, very engaged. So they want to they want to know more from you. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, let us see. We have got uh, Anzo Lafuria from University of São Paulo. He's asking um, from the first part of the talk. Do the new landowners claim the language of the old landowners, or is their language the new language of the landowners? <laughs> no. A very uh, interesting question. <laughs> yes. So, um, I th so from what I can see is actually that there is what happens is that there's a space that is normally claimed by the old landlords, and is given to the strangers, and then the strangers. Um, come and say, oh, this wasn't really your land, you know, this is now our land. And so they actually cut out a tiny little piece um, from the old landlord's territory and name it as theirs and introduce a new language regime. And so then their patrimonial language becomes the language of their new settlement. But of course, you can also have complete takeover and we know very little about this because these processes have not been studied uh, much by linguists. We know about them more through the work of historians and anthropologists. And um, so for instance, the anthropologist um, Carola Lenz has worked on um, land mobility and belonging in West Africa and has described all these different um, power structures and takeovers. And what she says, and that makes very much sense to me and also corresponds to colonial uh, perspective in general is that generally the landlords, so the old landlords or you know, the first settlers, um, they are really interested in acknowledging heterogeneity. Okay, because it reinforces their status as the landlords. But the settlers, when they take over, they want to negate difference. So then you get the shift to an ancestral language ideology because the presence, if they acknowledge the rights of people who were there before, then it weakens their, their status. Yeah, so this is just like Trump, you know, saying, you know, this, this is the United States and we speak English, right? This is a typical newcomer ideology that plays out in West Africa on a very, very local scale, but at a huge scale, of course, in settler colonialism. Um, yes, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think the audience has understood that uh, we have worked on this together <laughs> since your title yeah. my paper. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, uh, I also, I, I do agree. Some people have commented in Jibonkia that it's possible. It's actually not a problem if, um, if for example, in, in, in Brun, people, people, they know that there used to be uh, a Bainung, but now they're, they're uh, um, 
get Jola, at some point, then, well, they just talk Jola to their ancestors. <laughs> so people are quite liberal in having this changed, but they might also maintain it for some reasons and yes. have a special specialized clan within the community who knows how to speak that language, right? <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's very, these dynamics are very interesting. We've got um, uh, more questions. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Stenzel is asking if you uh, can connect, uh, if you can comment on parallels or differences between uh, West African and South American settings. Oh, just a, just a, uh, um, we've got, we've got about uh, five more minutes before the next session starts. But, uh, okay. but until then, we can answer Ooh, questions. Wow, and that's five minutes for West Africa <laughs> and Brazil. Oh my God, okay, where to start? Okay. So um, I think, um, yes, perils. So first of all, um, Creoles and their social function and the importance of social musicality for Creoles. So in Brazil, you have Nengatu, for instance, also a language associated with people who are in early contact with Portuguese and brokers. Um, then I think, um, maintenance um, of, of these dualisms that are uh, really written into the DNA of small-scale multilingualism and new language ideologies induced uh, through uh, colonialism. So in Brazil, of course, you had settler colonialism and we find that where settler colonialism happened and where indigenous people actually were, uh, you know, uh, resettled and new identities were created by Portuguese, you, you find that this balance has been completely disrupted and the way is towards shift to Portuguese. Whereas where the social functions and this diversity and unity is maintained, you, you find that small scale multilingualism is alive, but also changing. Yes, well, that was a... Uh, uh, um... A quick answer to a complicated question. <laughs> but we have had. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> yeah. We've got uh, um, yes, Tamara Kovac from also from USP was asking uh, something related to that as well, right? Um, <clears throat> about different concepts of of language and person in 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 South America as compared to West Africa, and if this would lead to different perceptions of uh, of, of of different language practices. In fact. Um, <laughs> Do you, would you like to comment on that? Yes, well, it's very difficult to compare actually, because I know, um, and I'm envious because uh, in the South American context, we have so much more in-depth anthropological linguistic knowledge about conceptions of persons and how the universe uh, is categorized, for instance, and, um, and we, we don't have that much in West Africa. So in that sense, I think I take inspiration more from Brazilian settings for future research. Um, but, um, what, sorry, what was the question again? I'm getting a little bit. <laughs> yes, it, it was about um, the, the different um, uh, conceptions uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of personhood mm -hmm. yes. and of, uh, the, the, you know, if, if this has an influence yes. on, on, on linguistic behavior. Yes, well, but that, that's really important because, so um, when we talk about the linguistic person and how it is construed, um, um, for the Brazilian context, we know a lot about language ideologies. And um, so, for instance, we know about very strict language etiquettes um, and ideals of being multilingual, but uh, keeping your languages separated um, so that you grow up in diverse settings with the much relaxed and the part relaxed. And then when you're an adult, you're only supposed to um, use your part relaxed. But we also now start getting actual research on language use of or Wilson de Lima Silva, who look at, you know, Stenson Co at um, Cotiria, Wilson de Lima at Desano, and see that that's actually not what people are doing in discourse. So in discourse, they're using features that can be associated with different codes, which is something that violates the language etiquette as has been described by anthropologists. Um, for very fine-grained indexical functions. And so I think we are scratching the surface really in order to understand how these persona, personae are construed and how that relates to language use. 
Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, um, I'm afraid we have to, um, we have to make uh, space for the next talk, but I would encourage the, uh, uh, the participants to, to maybe pose more questions in the chat. And, uh, and then, uh, Friedrich, if you, uh, uh, you, could, you could also come back to the chat and, uh, and answer um, the questions there, or uh, maybe just get in touch with you directly, <laughs> if anybody ah, okay. is interested. Well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know you're always open to for contacts and 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 communication. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. And I'm very interested uh, in Brazilian language as well and South American language. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I would uh, I will give you the last word to address your uh, uh, audience before we we close today's uh, session. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having stayed with me on this very bumpy road. At some point, uh, I really felt I couldn't think um, because Zoom, I was doing its very best to prevent me uh, from doing so. But yeah, I'm, I hope this was just the beginning of a conversation um, that also will happen, I guess, in asynchronous mode through uh, uh, listening to all the uh, different and fantastic that uh, have already happened in the series on related topics. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.